So what I want to talk about now is a technology called Docker. Docker is really, really, really young. It's about a month and a half old. So, um, sorry, the little thing there is fascinating. So it's about a month and a half old, and it's plumbing for doing deployments. And it's plumbing for doing deployments in a particular way. Um, who here was in Wes's talk just shortly, just a moment ago? OK, so not a ton of folks. I guess everyone who was in Wes's talk is headed for the coffee. So he talked a lot about release engineering. Uh, I'll rehash a little bit of it, because lots of folks here weren't in there. So <laughs> Docker does release engineering, does deployment. It's a, the piece of plumbing for it. And any particular deployment technology really needs to do three things. <clears throat> has to get the bits on the disk, uh, has to run something, and then it has to allow you to stop it, start it, you know, tell it to get the bits on the disk or whatnot, manage whatever it is that is being released. And so what I want to actually do is talk about Docker and each of these three steps. So we'll go through it, and we're going to have lots of live demos of how this works because talking about it's one thing and seeing it is kind of a different thing with this particular technology. So when we're putting bits on disk, um, there's a lot of different ways of deploying something. So typically, if you're deploying a Java thing, you build a war and you push it up to Tomcat or something. If you're deploying a, you know, a Ruby type thing, you know, you push it to, you know, you take, you push the whole Git repo somewhere. Uh, Python, typically, a lot of people do the same thing. And then over time, it's just saying, well, wow, managing dependencies. Can you turn the volume down just a little bit? The echo is freaking me out. Uh, managing dependencies just starts to get weird because you know you have all your you know your gems listed or your Python packages listed. You build things into the war, but do you have the right version of Tomcat? Do you have the right things on you know Tomcat's libpath? Um, if you need something native, does operations put the right thing on? And so over time, a lot of companies that do big sort of heterogeneous deployments start converging on the idea that your unit of deployment is a bundle with everything in it. You know, it has the runtime, it has every library that you depend on, it has the source code, it has the configuration. Um, and this is something that's been independently arrived at by, you know, my employer Ning, uh, by Apple, by Google, by, I'm trying to think who else, DotCloud wound up doing this, they made Docker, um, meta markets, parts of Facebook, uh, lots of people wind up converging on this idea that you have to take everything and bundle it together and push that bundle out. And so Docker, you know, this is the end state of a lot of the evolution of deployment technologies. And so Docker does this. Um, this is built by people who have done this all before. And so, but it does it just a little bit differently. Um, so Ning's particular one, our unit of deployment is a tarball with an RC script. So another way of doing it that's particularly popular on uh, sort of cloud things is to build, bake a golden image. You know, where a golden image is like an AMI that has everything on it. Um, this works if you do auto-scaling nicely, but it has some drawbacks. So typically here, you know, you have, you know, every single thing, an entire system. Um, it's big. You know, your tarball, or your bundle starts at 300 megs, and that's if you're really good at trimming down your system dependencies. You know, so, but Docker, does this, make some optimizations, we'll see what they are. But then you make an overlay, you make another file system that has some changes, you know, a different bundle, and you make another bundle that has some additional changes, and then you lay them all over top of each other with, uh, anyone here familiar with UnionFS or another UnionFS? Sweet, I never heard of this stuff before I met Docker a month and a half ago, and I love it now that I know about it. So Docker uses AUFS, another UnionFS, and it pulls these images together, creates a view of it as if it's one file system. It actually, when you deploy a container, it puts one more layer on top, which is a read-write for that container, and that's what it actually treats as the bits on disk. So you say, okay, here is a deployment mechanism layering a bunch of things. What does this actually mean in practice? So this is where you get to see me break things. So here I have, uh, this is just a Vagrant instance. 
that I have Docker on. It only runs on Linux with a relatively recent kernel um, because it needs a working LXC and a working uh, AUFS. Uh, the recommended kernel, of course, is 3.8, but it'll run on older ones as well. Um, so, so let us take a base image, uh, Docker run interactive with a TTY. Uh, let's just run an Ubuntu. 1210, and we'll run bash inside a container. So what that just did was it took, uh, let's see here, Docker history. Oh, Ubuntu 1210. So it took two different images. Uh, and squished them together and made a file system right here. Come on, okay, I'll just do this way. So we have what looks like a root file system that's spun up exactly for this container. You know, we exit out and the container's gone. Uh, let's run another one. So now let's say we wanna put something on this container. Um, I, uh, I hate Vim, so I'm gonna install Emacs really quickly while I'm going. Uh, we're going to talk about sort of the process model here, but it is grabbing, you know, normal app get install of Emacs onto the container. The network here is surprisingly good. I'm on the same Wi-Fi as everyone else. Uh, probably I shouldn't have actually done this, so I'm going to cancel out. We'll just do this. Okay. So if we look, though, let's inspect what it actually did. We can actually diff everything that it did against the base image that it came up with because it created a read-write layer for that particular container. And now if we wanted to, we can take that container and save it back to an image that we can use again later. Okay, so we just made a new image based on the changes that we made right there. Um, and so a typical way that you might want to deploy something you know, is you would, you know, if you want to build it manually by hand, you're experimenting, you just run bash and you put your stuff on. If you want to copy things onto it that are on a local disk, uh, the idiom is you send, you know, a tar over standard in and whatnot. Uh, this gets awkward. There is a easier way of doing it. Uh, so, so a lot of people, you know, it's like, hey, it would be really convenient to have a way to automate the building of these images. We want to make it repeatable. So uh, Docker is making something they call a Docker file, which just sort of explains this. Docker files, as of the current release, are only about half implemented. So I use a library that I wrote, oops, called Docker Maker, that lets you define what you want the image to look like. So if we look here, you know, you say, okay, I want to make an image. All of this is doing, and we'll run this, and you'll see the commands, is running command line stuff that you could do by hand. So it says, what image do we start at? Uh, because this is a live demo, I am speeding it up and using the previous version. And what do you want to commit it to? You know, this is just some metadata on it so you can figure out who, who wrote this thing. Uh, you can define environment variables that will be present whenever you run something on it. That becomes part of the image. And then, you know, hey, run this in bash. You know, in this case, you know, uh, do an app get update if it's not there, install netcat, python, pip, and then use pip to install honcho. Um, honcho is just a Python library for making use of proc files. Um, anyway, uh, you can then put something from the local file system into the container and set a default command. So when I ran it before, you'll notice that I ran bin bash. I specified the command. That's not super portable. If I have a MySQL container and I wanted to just start, I don't want to know what the command is for this versus that. Um, so you set a default command, and I tell it to expose a port. And all of this gets baked into the image. You know, so this is that same Ruby file. You can just see that it is running, you know, Docker commit add the metadata, docker run, uh, runs bash, where it cats standard in into the proc file, and it's committing after each step. So we could see, you know, the history of the image, everything that's been done, 
you know, we see the bit of bash that it ran. Uh, we saw that it did the app get install, um, and it scrolls up as you go. And all of this is image building. Um, as I say, this library right now, it's just a gem. It's in Ruby Gems. You can use it. Hopefully, you know, probably by the time this week is over, 3.3 will be out with more full Docker file support. Uh, the reason that'll be interesting is because they're building sort of uh, a sort of git-like hash functionality where it won't run it if it already has the layer that you're looking to get. Um, so let's see, that's image building. Now, an important aspect is uh, once you build your image, you just have it on whatever machine you're building on, in this case, a Vagrant virtual machine on my laptop. OK, so let's push it up to a registry. And so this is actually pushing it up to the public registry, but you can run a private registry just as easily. And I don't know if I've actually pushed this buildy one, which is my play image, um, up to the public registry, so it might take a while. And so in that sense, I'll just let that go for a moment. So that's the concepts behind the image format. Now, the way it actually stores this, if we look, yeah, see there it's pushing, but I'm going to cancel because that's boring. So var lib docker, oh, var lib. OK, um, so it maintains a graph of images. And unfortunately, this you know, is a small screen. So let me see if I can, there we go. So all of these are all the various images that it knows about. And it maintains a tree where if we look back here, each of these file systems, in this case, A2's parent is B7. B7's parent is base. And so each image knows who its parent is. And when you run something based on an image, it traverses that tree and builds the union file system. Now, there's one part I haven't talked about here, which is how you mount external volumes in, persistent ones that aren't part of that. Um, and we'll get to that later. Any questions about the sort of image basis, like how you get the bits on the disk? OK, this is particularly nice because if you take uh, just our case, you know, a sort of medium-sized application, you know, a few thousand servers, you know, 50 or some deployable things. If we have Java 6, Java 7, PHP, Ruby, C, different libraries dependent for different things, how do we make sure we have the right version in every case? You can try splatting it into the tarball, uh, put an LD preload, um, you know, juggle all that around. But it's a heck of a lot easier if you can just say, look, here's the file system image I want. Um, and so it's awfully convenient to have that golden image concept without some of the overhead. And when we get into the process, we'll see where that becomes nice. Questions about getting the bits onto disk? Going once. It is the end of the conference and y'all are tired. If you don't get questions, I will start asking you questions. I used to teach high school. I know how to do that. You ask the people in the back corners to keep them awake. I'm not kidding. No questions. OK, so how does then Docker actually move these file system images around? What do you think? You didn't ask me, so I'll ask you. It just creates a tarball and slaps metadata in and pushes it to the registry server. OK, so the second thing any piece of deployment plumbing needs to do <coughs> is run something. So we got the bits on disk. We have the file system that we want. We created a read-write layer for this container. Um, how do you run something on that? And typically, you want to run a process tree. Very few things are a single process. I mean, I guess if you're running you know, .NET or Java, it's probably a single process. Anything else has several things. And since I was using the proc file earlier, I went with that again. Uh, can everyone here, actually, who here cannot read a, a uh, proc file? Everyone can, or you're not admitting to it? Who here is purple? OK, who here isn't purple? Who here is human? OK, you all admit to being human. You're awake. So this basically a proc file, for, just in case you're afraid to admit it. Now, this defines, hey, I want to have a process named web, and you do that. And this is the smallest web server I could figure out how to make. Um, 
This just starts a basic web server. It's included in the Python standard library, listening on port 7000. You know, when you start it up using Honcho, you know, the process tree basically looks like this. You know, you have shell invoking Python. Now, you're running this in a container. You typically want to run a whole bunch of containers on a machine. Um, these things run in something called LXC, or Linux containers. Uh, do you know about Linux containers? Okay, not a lot of people do. Do you know about Solaris zones? Okay, same people, so that wasn't so helpful. Do you know about Cheroots? BSD jails. Oh my gosh, everyone, go install FreeBSD and play. You should know about BSD jails. Okay, so the idea of a container is you, sh you have the same kernel, uh, you have one kernel running on a host, and you have a completely different user space. Um, I say completely different, it's, it's not quite that simple. But in this case, you have a completely different user space. So you allocate a virtual interface, you allocate a root file system, the UnionFS, um, you set up the device tree, uh, if you need to, you set up a TTY, uh, you spin all of that up and you start the process in that container. And it's called a container because the idea is you can't get out. Um, on Linux, AppArmor does a pretty good job, it's hard to get out. Um, you know, so on a given host, you want to be able to run a whole bunch of these things, and they're all configured to listen on port 7000, which is why they're all given their own virtual interface. But if they're all given their own virtual interface, which is just attached to loopback so nobody else can talk to them very easily, you need some way to map into that. And so Docker will have the ability to map ports into the process. So it spins up the interface and sets up IP table rules to map things that you tell it to into the various containers that you have running. So from each of these perspectives, the Honcho is the root process, it starts things, it has its own interface, has its own file system, is running on its own, own little server, and it is the only thing running there. There's no init, there's no other daemons, it is running a single process in the same memory space with the same kernel. So it has very, very low overhead. Um, the last time I benchmarked this seriously, it was, uh, let's see, 2010, so two and, two and a half, three years ago. Um, LXC, Linux containers, under full saturation, maxing out the machine, uh, gave us about a four to seven percent penalty on the network interface, and that's all. And that's only when you completely saturate the machine. Under normal load, you know, 50 to 70 percent uh, capacity, you know, it was unmeasurable. So there's very, very little overhead for this. There's no memory overhead for it. You're just running a regular, pro oh, there's a little bit of memory overhead because you're reloading shared libraries, but they're tiny now. You know. um, the kind folks at Berkeley that made this shared library thing should now put it back to bed. Um, and so you run things. So let's see actually how we run it. You know, we, we saw running a little bit. Let's see, let's stop being root. So, uh, you know, we, we make this thing, you know, so we just ran it. Um, now we can say docker run, uh, we want to detach this time, Brian and Buildy. And so it's running. And every container that's running is basically given a hash so you can identify what the container is. You can see what's running with docker ps, which is hard to read because it's folding across the screen. You know, so, you know, you have the hash, uh, you have the image, you have what the command was, you know, when it was started up, how long it's been going, uh, and the port mapping. Part of our specification said, hey, expose port 7000. So this is running on 49170. Um, and sure enough, uh, we can curl down you know, the simple HTTP thing that's running there. Now, if we want to, we can run a few more. Uh, oh, dash F, typo. We'll run a few more just for fun. You know, so we've got a bunch running now. How many is that, five? Six of them. Oh, sorry, five, because we have the status line up there. Uh, and you'll see they're all running on, you know, slowly incremental and ephemeral ports. Um, 
we can actually, let's see, let's pick one of these. Now, you can look at what's running there. You can get the standard output. Uh, there's nothing interesting. Uh, Honcho detects whether or not there's a TTY attached and doesn't bother outputting if there isn't. Uh, so what we can do is actually run one. Uh, let's see. Brian M. Buildy. And we'll see that it is actually running one web worker um, and a PID. And we can kill it off. And so from the perspective of the thing that I'm deploying, this has spun up seven of these servers running here, um, roughly equivalent to running an entire virtual machine in terms of isolation, you know, but with almost no memory utilization. Um, uh, let's see. You know, so this thing thinks it's using 362K. I mean, that's totally boring, which is fabulous. Instead of, you know, 512 megs for a virtual machine. Now, one of the things you can also do if you want to run it, you can limit the memory. Uh, you cannot yet sort of limit CPU shares, but the capabilities there because it's just LXC. Um, you know, LXC gives you the ability to limit almost anything you want. So we're running the process. It's happily going. Uh, life is good. Questions about process running? LXC, AUFS. Ah, thank you, sir. Oh, sorry, I'm making you run around before the end with questions. Hi, I got a question. Uh, all the communication is going over loopback, local loopbacks at uh, these containers, or what, what do IP tables in this? Okay, so, oh, the, the traffic is going over loopback to them, is what you asked? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I fudged it. I don't think it actually doesn't go over loopback, it goes over a bridge interface. Um, and the bridge interface, if you want, can be allocated on loopback or it could be allocated on your public one. Um, and so if we look, uh, docker dash i dash t buildy bin bash. Oh, this is impossible to read. Um, so each zero has been allocated at 172.16, blah, 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 totally boring. Um, if we look on the host, this is really, why is it formatting it this way? OK, so what you can't easily see, there we go. We have a Docker zero loopback, or not loopback, bridge interface, LXC, BR, you can't read it. So it creates a bridge interface and then creates child interfaces over that and runs it as bridge networking. So you have a virtual interface on a bridged one that by default is listening on uh, 127, and then there's an IP tables rule set up to route things there. Um, speaking of overhead, you do get a little bit of overhead from IP tables as well. Um, in theory, you could do away with it. In practice, it's baked pretty much into it. Um, but the overhead is very small on recent kernels. IP tables is pretty fast now. Good question. Does my explanation make sense to anyone? I see a lot of glazed over eyes. If you don't know Linux networking, I just said blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I apologize. OK, I have another question. Uh, oh. What is the difference uh, between Docker and uh, OpenVZ, LXC, or something like that? Docker and? OpenVZ, LXC. Oh, OpenVZ, yeah. OK, so uh, the question is, what's the difference between Docker and OpenVZ? Um, OpenVZ is a containerization thing just like LXC. And so Docker theoretically could work with OpenVZ instead of LXC. The difference is LXC is actively developed, and I don't think OpenVZ has had a release in two years. Um, I could be wrong, but I don't think it has. And so it's using something just like OpenVZ, um, except that it's you know building up the file. It's a way of using that that's really good for deploying applications. Does that make sense? So it, it's effectively very, very similar. OK. Yeah, so the question was asked was, is it safe to say that LXC is the only backend that Docker supports? And yes, LXC is the only backend that Docker supports, full stop. 
Um, and today it's LXC running on uh, x86-64. So it's very limited on what it can run on. Any recent Linux is theoretically supportable. It's just no one's bothered yet. The project is a month and a half old. OK, process questions before I dive into the next bit. Oh, we do have one. See, I love this audience. Questions are good. It makes me think you pay attention. OK, that's a quick question. Is there a Docker daemon running? Aha, uh, uh -huh. very good. The question was, is there a Docker daemon running? Yes, I didn't talk about how Docker itself runs. Uh, so there is, in fact, a Docker daemon running. Um, it is the same process as the command line that I've been invoking. It was just told to daemonize. And the Docker daemon, this is basically for performance. It starts up, and it manages the state of what's there. Now, the different things that are running are actually independently daemonized. So you know you can kill off the Docker daemon, and you know they stay there running. Um, interesting choice. I'd have made them child processes, but you know it's whatever. So there's a Docker daemon running. You generally want to start it up over, you know, with upstart or a normal service, however you want to do that on the system you're on. Uh, most of the work on Docker is being done on Ubuntu right now, just because most people use Ubuntu right now. And so there's, you know, I'm using upstart for the demo. Um, the command line client talks to the daemon right now um, over a TCP port. Go11 one, one fixes the reason that's a TCP port instead of a BSD socket. Um, a remote CLI is due out any day now, or sorry, a remote, not CLI, uh, remote API, like HTTP style API. Um, I'm of mixed opinions. I kind of like using a BSD socket and SSH, but you know, everyone wants an HTTP API so they can script it more easily. Um, so all the commands actually go to the daemon. The daemon does everything. The command line I'm doing is just communicating with the daemon and telling the daemon to do things. Very good question. OK. Cool, I've got plenty of time. OK, so we've looked at, you know, you know, so the two main components, how do you get the bits on disk, and how do you run things, uh, we looked at. And finally, you know, so you're running things. Uh, you have, you know, how do you actually manage all of this stuff? Now, we mentioned there's the daemon, and the other key component, if you actually want to build a system using this, is the registry. The registry is just has a standard API that the daemon knows how to talk to, and you can push images up to it and the metadata about images so that you can then pull them back down. Um, so if we look at this, uh, let's see, I didn't push that one. So here is a server. I spun it up ahead of time because I'm lazy and I didn't want everyone to have to wait for a Rackspace Cloud server to come up. But this is something running in Rackspace Cloud where I just did you know, an apt get install uh, LXC Docker after adding the PPA. And it has all of that happily running now. So if you want to pull an image down, uh, let's pull. We'll see what this is in just a moment. You know, we can now pull down an image that was pushed up to the repository. You know, we can go into that particular thing. And so this is an application. Uh, what was it? I guess yesterday. Is John Paul in here? He's not. He left. Oh, well. The demo is just for John Paul, who's hiding in back. He was complaining there's no standard way to deploy node stuff, and he does a lot of node work. I'm like, well, there we go. We'll deploy some node stuff. So I made a bare bones node application. You know, it is uh, an express, it is literally the express hello world. And there we go. I set up, let's make an image for that. We'll start with, this is another case where to speed up the demo, because I didn't want to do an app get install. I used the old version, but this works just as well on Ubuntu 10.12. You know, we set up some environment information, same as before. Uh, we install curl. We curl down the most recent version of Node. Probably you would not want to pull this over the internet. You'd want it on your own build repository. Um, you symlink it into slash user local. If there was an app there before, you whack it. You copy your application into the image. You set the default command to run Node. And you expose port 8000. Totally boring. Uh, if we go on to, oh, let's see here. Let's go. Uh, 
you know, we see that, there you go, you have an Express server listening on 3000. So this is on my Mac, running on the Mac. You know, typical Express, hello atmosphere. Um, it's lying, it's not really running on Docker. Uh, we can go into the virtual machine. Come on. You know, source, ANA. I don't even know if I have Node installed. Node app. Oh, I don't have Node installed on the host. But that doesn't matter because we can build a Docker image that has it. You know, and then we can run. So the Docker image, you'll notice, uh, builds Brian M ANA. Uh, this naming is, Brian M says which repository. Uh, I'm defaulting to the public repository, so it's a namespace within the public repository. And ANA is just a Node app. You know, so uh, let's just for the fun of it change something. Uh, let's see, views, index. Uh, what would we like to say? Someone give me something new to change in this application. Hello? Hello, Poznan? Uh, let's see, title. I don't know, let's see. Uh, there's an accent in there, isn't there? Sorry, I'm not doing the accent, I'm American. Okay, um, so let's make it again. So we just bake it into the image. Uh, let's see. Yeah, let's see. Um, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, I'm going to cheat, and we're going to, oh, no, because it's a whole bunch of changes, so I'll just do this. Uh, we're going to push it, just for the fun of it. So we'll push that up, and while it's being pushed up, we'll run, run it to make sure it's working locally, dash D. Uh, so there's just, you know, because people run things, you know, there's a little shortcut to get uh, docker port, the image. We told it was on 8,000, right? No, it wasn't 8,000. Uh, oh, what did we say? It's on, uh, let's see, docker port. Oh, it is on 8,000. So why is it being cranky? Let's take a look. HTTP get localhost. And we broke something. Oh, yeah. This is why you have tests and why you don't do live demos. OK, so let's see. Views. Uh, oh, because I was trying to pull a variable called hello puts not out. OK, uh, so let's make it again. Uh, let's see, we run it, docker run, docker port 8000, HTTP get, localhost. Sure enough, now it says, uh, hello, puts none. We have our changes. Yay, programming still works. Uh, docker, now we push it up to the registry because we actually want to say, hey, let's actually deploy this somewhere just for the fun of it. Uh, this was Brian M A N A. So, what it's going to do now is, from the last time it was, you know, baked and pushed, it walks up that tree of file systems and pushes each of them into the registry. And it takes a moment, um, not terribly long, because what the what the union file system does is every time you change a file, it takes the new file and puts it down there. You know, it just basically overwrites it, um, but on the read write layer, not underneath. So you still have all the old stuff. So, you know, despite the fact that, see, it's skipping, 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 skipping. You can tell I was playing with this image a lot, so it has a long history. Yes, sir? Where's that magic registry of yours? Where are you pushing this to? Where's this where am I pushing it to? Yeah. Okay, so where, the question was, where am I pushing this to? Uh, because I'm using the public registry, I'm pushing it to index.docker.io which is just a whole bunch of public containers. So actually, there you go, recently updated, Brian M A N A. Um, it's got six downloads. I'm kind of scared of that. Hopefully that's all me testing. Um, you know, so if you just want something, you know, like, hey, look, someone you know, has a container for Postgres or Memcached or a Minecraft server. That's an obvious one as a Minecraft server. Um, I didn't think about that one. OK, so it's pushed up to the public registry. And now if you wanted to, you could run a private registry the code for the registry is open source. It's 
sitting there on GitHub. Um, it's just a little Python Flask application. Um, okay, so you know we have it here. You know that's running on Vagrant on a Mac. That's kind of boring. Um, let's pull it down on our quote-unquote production server. You know, so here we're going to pull down. You see the index Docker I/O, and it's downloading the most. You know, all the changes that we made. Now my Docker Maker gem, it's really inefficient. Every command, it commits a new image. Um, that's because I'm lazy and I'm hoping Docker Builder gets done soon. So we're here now. You know, so, so let's run one. Docker run dash D, Brian M, A and A. Docker port, uh, it was 8,000, right? Okay, so 49157. Now, this is our production thing. So, you know, right now there's nothing running on our production server. Atmosphere XNIO, kindly hosted at Rackspace. Um, so, let's add it to our load balancer. Oh, what was it? HTLB. So, we just added this instance to our load balancer. It'll take a second to register, and hello puts none. Um, you know, if you want to look, the load balancer is just, you know, it's El Cheapo load balancer, which for some reason I can't make the text smaller. Um, it's Apache with mod balancer. Um, and we can see that we have our, you know, one thing. Now, this is Node, so it's a single process. That's not so helpful running one. You know, let's add, you know, one, two, three, four. Uh, I'm not going to actually put them all into the load balancer for now because I'm lazy. Docker port 8000, uh, HTLB. HTLB is literally just a wrapper around curl so that it's more likely to succeed. Um, I look at my foo balancer, and we see that the additional one is there now. So a typical, you know, if you want to deploy this to production, you push up your image, you run it, and you route to it somehow from the host. Alternately, you know, you have the particular thing put itself into a service registry, you know, however you want to find your various production servers. Um, if you don't want to have this layer of indirection, you know, you want to have one-to-one -one ports, um, you can do this. Because a lot of people don't like having that layer of indirection. And this says map port 8000 to port 8000. It's just a little syntactic hack to make that easier. So now you don't have to do that layer of indirection. Uh, what I did was I put a little colon in front of the port when I said to expose it. Um, so here I'm running I, a node. I, I, oh. have, I have a question. Uh, yes. What now if you run uh, multiple instances with one to one port redirection? If, Can you, I'm sorry, I'm... Uh, what if you run a one-to-one -one port redirection mm -hmm. and you run multiple instances? Ah, you want, okay, so if you configure it one-to-one -one and you run multiple instances, it's going to give you an error when it tries to start the second one. You know, so let's see, this is uh, A and A. So let's do it. Uh, let's see, we have that on Vagrant. So we bake that change into our image. You know, keep in mind, he just made a whole AMI effectively right there. Uh, Docker run Brian M A and A. Of course, I forgot to detach it. Yep, already in use, 8,000. And so it says, sorry, can't do that. Um, which is why, by default, it just picks an ephemeral port and maps it over IP tables. Um, some people really don't like that. They're like one-to-one -one all the time. So your choice. Okay. Um, oh, I'm running out of time. One, one, uh, another question. Uh, so you must run uh, Docker on each production server, and you add some oh. uh, complexity to each do? production node. Okay. So if you run Docker on your production server, you have complexity on your production node. Uh, is it a is it a way to uh, Synchronize with production without running Docker on on all servers. Right, I'm trying to. Could you, whoever was just speaking, can you raise your hand? I can't see you. 
Ah, oh, thank you, sir. So, okay, the question is, if you're running Docker on your production servers, can you synchronize it without running Docker on production? No. Um, okay. Docker is the deployment plumbing. And right now, Docker, as far as I'm aware, nobody with any real traffic uses Docker in production. Uh, Docker came out of DotCloud saying, you know, hey, we have to re-implement basically our deployment plumbing because we have the one we grew up with and it's really crufty. Let's just do it open source. You know, it makes life easier for their customers. You know, they can migrate onto it really, really easily. Um, it is not, so typically the way that you would run this, uh, the way that people run things like this right now, because a lot of people run things that are conceptually the same, but in practice, you know, there's different plumbing around it, is you run the daemon on a server and then you deploy however many things, you know, be it, you know, Ning typically does between four to six things on a particular piece of hardware. You know, so four to six one, four to six type virtualization. Um, other people run much higher. You know, if you're doing like sort of a VPS style thing, you might run a thousand things on a uh, quadruple extra large instance. Um, but the key thing is the only thing you have running for doing deployments is Docker. Okay. Everything else on the system is managed as sort of an operational platform. You know, you say, here's the server, here's how we actually get physical access to the, or not physical, SSH access to the server. That's all set up. And nothing else needs be cared about from the perspective of engineering or, you know, the people writing the application code. You're like, hey, here is, you know, the tag. So you can deploy, if you want to, uh, a particular tag so I haven't been doing uh, this, um, you know, three, four. If you don't specify the tag to deploy, it deploys the most recent one. Um, so you say, hey, here's the most recent tag for the image we just pushed. Please, you know, roll it out across production gradually. Um, and I didn't show how to reuse file systems. Uh, you can also say volumes from, you know, so you're updating something that's stateful. You want to pull the sort of persistence, you know, from, you know, whatever the hash of the one you're upgrading is. And then it'll actually share the file system um, because it's all just Linux namespaces under the covers. Um, no, we've been running something like Docker since 2006 um, at Ning. Um, we call it Galaxy. It's also open source. It's effectively unusable because it's tied into the rest of our infrastructure. Um, it's not what we want, but the problem is everybody has, that's running something like this, it evolves out of, like, oh, you got your whole bunch of scripts, you start building it up, building it up, it's tied into your monitoring, it's tied into sort of operational management, it's tied into sort of configuration management, um, and unless you have everything else identical, it's not useful, which is why I'm excited about Docker, because it doesn't have ties into anything pre-existing. And so I don't have to invent this again if I move on somewhere. And it does things a lot better. So, you know, one of the problems, um, this is anecdotal, I have no inside knowledge, but, you know, rumor has it, for instance, when, uh, when you look at this, like, wow, some of these things get big. Let's say that we're uh, Facebook and we write a PHP to C compiler because that's fun and we build big statically linked things. And all of a sudden we now have a, you know, two gig statically linked binary that we need to sync out across 100,000 servers. And your network dies every time you deploy. So one of the nice things with Docker though is because it has a union file system and you typically will start from the same base, you know, once a file system layer is there, it doesn't need to pull it again. And so the typical 300 megs is there and then this, the changed files for each deployment get pushed out. And that is a lot better than our particular one. Um, you know, because we're at about 150 meg deploy bundles right now, and that gets annoying. It's just a lot of space on disk when you have, you know, thousands of them. Yes, sir. Oh. So basically, this is like version control for your deployment environment. Uh, so, that, yeah, is it like version control? It is, it shares a lot of characteristics with version control for your deployment and that it keeps the version history as you go. Um, it doesn't have the same flexibility as a dedicated version control system. Like there's no concept of branching and merging or whatnot. 
Um, but if you think of it as a single line, it definitely is version control. And, uh, are you pl planning to include branching and, and other features like this? Uh, I am not aware of any plans to include the concepts of like branching and merging of file systems. Okay, um, and um, how is the versioning real? It's using the union file system, right? Oh, so how is the versioning, how is it implemented? Uh, let's show you. Um, so, var, lib, docker. Okay, so if we look at, let's find one of our things that's running. Okay, so this is the, so right here, we have the sort of representation of a container that's running. And here is the read-write file system dedicated for that container. And if we look, you know, we can see the root file system that's the UnionFS that is you know, the, the sort of view of the file system that's presented to the container underneath that read-write layer. And we can see how it is built. Uh, dot JSON. Oh, it's really a mess. Uh, let's see, ID. Uh, there we go, image. Okay, so how it's built is if we go up to graph. So here is the first, the, the parent image. Um, and the parent image has a whole bunch of stuff there. And you'll see that there's a layer here that has the changes that were added. So this one looks like one of the uh, Brian M. Buildies because it has the proc file. This is actually the topmost layer um, on the UnionFS underneath the read-write for the container. And we can see uh, this tarball is basically the portable version that gets uploaded. So we've pushed this so it made a tarball. And if we look at the JSON, uh, let's see, it's a big ugly mess, but somewhere in here is a parent attribute. Uh, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, Anyone see the parent? I don't think I have JQ or whatnot. Anyone remember what the Python module that magically formats JSON is? Ah, nobody remembers? Everyone should know this one, but I don't either. So anyway, somewhere in that blob of JSON is a pointer to the parent. And so, what's that? Second line. Oh, parent, thank you. And so, we can go back up there and go into the parent. And we see here, here's the next layer down. You know, the next layer down actually didn't have anything. All it has is the dev tree, which is handled dif differently. Um, probably that's because I was committing something like, what's the default command? And so this will actually be effectively elided when things get pushed. And you can trace that all the way. So when you actually put it onto the server, all of these things are splatted onto the file system. And then the UnionFS configuration, which you can see in, let's see, I want to go out of graphs, into containers. Uh, oh, I'm not going to dig in. Um, the LXC configuration basically has the uh, UnionFS mount, which is a huge, every single thing you want to put into it winds up in the command line, and it builds the file system as a union of all of those directories, which is how it's actually realized. But all writes go into the little read-write layer in the container. Yes? And how is it better from versioning the entire file system with Git or, or something like that? So you how could, is it? Yeah, you could version the entire file system using mm -hmm. Git. Yes. Uh, and how is the approach uh, proposed by Docker better? Okay, so the question is, how is this approach proposed by Docker better? Because um, it's serving a different purpose. So here, for instance, is, uh, let's say you want to fire up, you want to build a database in a known state for running your integration tests. You fire up a Docker container, you set up your known state, you commit it. Now, when you fire up based on that commit, you have a brand new slate for making any changes and you stop it and they get thrown away. And you fire up another container off that state, you reset back to the initial state. And so it's only, the, the goal is to be able to you know, have all of these layers and manipulate the layers as stacks in a file system layer as compared to a fully realized merged single file system. 
And I say, not in, you're, you're right, that's not perfect for all situations. So, you know, one of the, uh, Jerome, uh, anyway, Jerome, has an implementation on top of BetterFS instead of on top of UnionFS that does exactly that and it flattens it down. And then you could treat that as a Git tree if you wanted to. Um, I don't know, the, the separate layer concept is kind of nice because you just push the layer, push the layer. I can see the appeal of just pushing a Git tree as well. It just isn't that way right now. Yes, please. Uh, if I just may uh, come back to the example you gave previously, uh, the, the Facebook example, where you have like a two gigabyte binary that you need to distribute it across a huge number of machines. Yep. Okay. Uh, so we have a similar uh, problem in the Rackspace public cloud. Yep. That we do like continuous deployment. And every so often we need to distribute a new, new images across a huge number of machines. And um, the way it was solved there is, uh, is to use the BitTorrent. Yep. <laughs> That's popular for this. Yeah, just wanted to share this as yeah. a kind of... Although, I will argue thing. that BitTorrent doesn't lighten the load on the network anyway. It just sort of shed, it moves, it evens it out. Yeah. You know, it's a nice way to even the load out. You still have to move all the bits. Yeah, but we, we sort of, the, the team realized huge uh, improvements or yeah. in, in, in distribution just by using BitTorrent. Yep. So yeah, BitTorrent is definitely a solution to that. I prefer to, you know, pushing the diff is nice. But for something where you really have, like, here is your fully baked image, yeah, the, pushing the diff doesn't work because that's, you know, a gzip tarball usually. Okay, so uh, let's see, what do I have? I'm totally out of time, but I'm the last person, so I'm allowed to go over. Uh, we pushed the end-to-end -end demo. Okay, so um, everything that we've done here, Docker is at docker.io. Uh, it's created by .cloud. I do not work for .cloud. I am a contributor to it. Um, I don't really own it. They pretty much control the project, but they're very open to other people coming in and helping. Uh, all of these sources that I've done today, the sort of vagrant configuration and stuff to install Docker is right here. So you can check out that repo and start doing everything you saw here today. Um, and until Docker Builder is more mature, the little, the source code for the Docker Maker gem that I demoed um, is right there. Uh, I can take any more questions. I have a bonus slide if I you know, didn't have enough information. But I want to take questions before I talk about how do you do configuration in this world? One quick question. Yeah. Uh, how to make update of underlying system? How to make an update on the underlying system? Yes, using Docker. Uh, so if you want to update on the host, yeah. so if you want to make an update on the host, I would probably use Chef personally. However, it doesn't matter. You can do it any way you want. You can restart the Docker daemon and life continues. Um, the only updates you need to be concerned about are kernel updates because anytime you make a kernel update, you typically have to bounce the kernel. Um, you know, so if you physically bounce the machine, the Docker daemon won't survive, obviously. Um, but you make updates however you want. You know, you use a typical configuration management system that's operationally oriented. CF Engine, Puppet, Chef, Ansible, they all work great. In my opinion, they're horribly shitty for deploying applications, but they work great for maintaining a fleet of servers. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Yes, sir. <laughs> Except from the overhead, how is it different from uh, sending snapshots of a virtual machine? Okay. So other than the overhead, how is this different than sending snapshots of a virtual machine? Like, like pat patches from the virtual, you have a base virtual machine and then you apply patches to it. Yeah. Um, you're not, so when you say a virtual machine, you mean like a hypervisor style virtual machine? You know, like uh, VMware, KVM. All right. Uh, so typically, a hypervisor require, you know, it runs its own kernel, it runs its entire memory space, it's all pre-allocated, and it doesn't share it very well. Um, so in terms of getting the bits on disk, whatever, you're sending a diff, it's not going to be much different. Um, in terms of running the process, it will generally have significantly less overhead than a hypervisor because it's sharing the kernel um, and sharing the network stack. And the, 
it'll generally have so less memory utilization, uh, sort of less network overhead. You know, so KVM, you know, going back to where I was saying like the LXC overhead is on four to seven percent. You know, at the same time, KVM overhead for us we are measuring is closer to like fifteen to twenty percent overhead um, when you're fully saturating it. Um, again, it wasn't particularly measurable under nominal load, but it's nice to be able to absorb bursts better. Um, you can run more things with this a little bit easier because you're sharing the memory. Um, it's, you know, it, you know, I don't, do you know a good thing that pushes sort of, um, you know, like, uh, either like a VMware image or AMI or I don't know what Rackspace calls their images. What does Rackspace call it? What's open cloud, OpenStack call images? Images? Okay. You know, I don't know something that sends diffs of those very well. If you do, I'd like to learn about it. What's that? I think Azure is trying to, Azure? Okay. Uh, trying to do something like this, but I'm not sure. I'm not very familiar with yeah. that. Um, so basically, the concept is very similar. It's all about performance. Well, the, it, it's about you know, lower overhead so you can run more things on less hardware. Sure. Um, you know, like it's easy to run this on EC2 if you're on EC2, or on, I demonstrated running it on Rackspace if you're on Rackspace. Um, you know, I ran it on my Mac under Vagrant. Um, you know, it, it's very portable and easy to do that way. Um, I would not want to, you know, so right now I just left, you know, eight or so of them running. Uh, I would not want to spin up eight or so VMware or, or um, uh, virtual box, virtual machines on my laptop, uh, particularly virtual box, because they would just start dying. At least VMware would slow down instead of die. Thanks. Oh, yeah, happy. Okay, I see people approaching, so I think I am absolutely out of time now. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Kind I'll of a